Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you to the webinar on simulation with Climate Studio today. I'm Yashima Chen, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, next slide, please. So first, I would like to acknowledge the support of the Department of Science and Technology and the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. I would also like to acknowledge Climate Studio as an affiliate for Solar Decathlon India. Uh, next slide. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so here are a few announcements for today. Uh, first, we have received the deliverable one submissions and we will provide you with our feedback and comments by October 28th. Next, uh, we will publish the next update of the competition guide in the coming week. It will have all the instructions and outline for your deliverable two, which is due on November 30th. And lastly, all team members must complete all the online learning modules by December 31. With this, your team will, without this, your team will not be able to qualify for the finals. Now, before we get into today's session, I would like to take a quick poll to know a little bit more about your status on the self-learning modules. So uh, if we could um, launch the poll here, please. Right, so the question is, uh, what is your status with the self-learning modules? And we have the following options. Um, so the first one is, I have started all the five self-learning modules rolled out so far. Uh, next, I have not been able to start because I'm not able to access the online platform. Next is not able to start because of my college workload. Um, the fourth option is that I have not been able to start because I have some internet problems. Um, then not able to start because I intend to become a last minute hero. And um, the sixth option is I haven't accessed this because I am not a student participant. So in case your faculty uh, lead or uh, you know a technical resource group member uh, that's the option you choose here. And lastly, we the, the option is, you know, I haven't accessed for other reasons. So um, I think uh, we can end the poll now looking at the answers. Yeah, okay. Okay, it's great to see that, you know, 47% of you have started all the five self-learning modules. And we know that, you know, there is a lot of college workload as well. So, you know, we have given you the deadline till December 31, which accounts for your, your, the small summer winter break that you guys have. And we hope that, you know, the self-learning modules become an asset for you and you are able to use uh, them as a part of your design. Uh, moving ahead, um, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, the previous one. Yes. Okay, so uh, today's session is being conducted by Alston Jakubek and Timur Dogan. Uh, I apologize if there's uh, an error with the pronunciation. Um, so they are taking, they are talking to us from the East Coast of the United States. So it's early morning for them. Good morning to you, Alston and Timur. Um, so Alston is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, where he focuses his efforts on the design of buildings and cities with emphasis on human comfort, performance simulation, and low energy design strategies. Alston co-created the popular DIVA tool for calculating the daylighting and energy performance and actively, actively develops new software tools as part of his research. Timur is an assistant professor in the Department of Architecture and the director of the Environmental Systems Lab, a faculty fellow at the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability and a field member of the Department of Architecture, Department of City and Regional Planning, the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, as well as systems engineering program. His work empowers architects and urban designers to optimize their design proposals regarding their energy demand, 
and supply comfort and livability today they both will show how climate studio can be used for effective net zero energy building design now this is your opportunity to learn about the software from the developers themselves as always you are free to send in your questions at any time during the webinar and we will take as many questions as time allows during the session and with that it's over to you timur thank you Let's see if i can share my screen great okay well uh, welcome everyone it's a great pleasure to be here and to introduce uh, climate studio to you which um, we've developed over the past um, year quite extensively um, for rhino 6 so this is a software tool that allows you to do really advanced daylighting simulations and um, fairly simple fast uh, energy models um, as well and we'll dive into this um, just briefly so once you um, once you have installed Climate Studio, and I believe uh, Elson Jakubiak has shared an installer with everyone, and there will be uh, potentially some updates coming um, in, in a couple of days. Um, once you have installed it and you open up Rhino, you should see a toolbar popping up that looks kind of like this one. And the way to access, and I already saw a question around this in, um, in the chat, um, is to then, you know, if you, if you see this toolbar, this software has been successfully installed. And um, this is basically, these are the toolkits for the Rhino side of everything. Uh, you can also launch Grasshopper, which is a, a visual scripting environment that uh, is uh, fairly popular for the energy side, as, at least, um, and it, it, incredibly powerful. And um, the workflows that um, we will um, show you today, I will cover a little bit the Rhino side, but then also dive into the Grasshopper side, because this is here where you can actually do some optimization you can combine these simulations with other uh, data points that you might ha may have. Um, so looking at photovoltaics and so forth as well. And um, Elson and I prepared um, a little uh, simulation game for you um, that we want to play with you kind of as an interactive exercise using the polling feature. Um, for the Indian context, we have a, um, uh, a workflow that we also will share with you that will allow you to do these kind of studies within the grasp environment. And um, just to double check that the software is installed properly, you should all have a tab that kind of, that says Climate Studio up here, if you open up Grasshopper. If that's not the case, then um, feel free to reach out to us and we'll try to figure out what, why the installation went wrong. <laughs> Elson is laughing. <laughs> um, we'll, give, we'll give out his personal phone number and email address. Um, Okay, no, uh, uh, just kidding. So let's let's take uh, take a look at the software um, more closely on the Rhino side. So um, the way to start it, and since we are interested in the energy modeling workflow for this webinar, let's take a look at the thermal modeling workflow. So what you see if you click on these icons is also a command. If you type in CS Energy into the command line, you should uh, see a panel pop up that looks like this, and these panels are. Um, dockable so you can actually slide them into the sidebar here and then uh, you know keep everything nice and clean and organized and really the way that it works is kind of it explains you what you need to do in the steps below so here in this case we uh, need to set up a weather file uh, and then we need to add some objects to the whole uh, scenario so um, selecting a weather file is, is fairly simple you just um, oops that's not what I want to do. Um, just go and pick a folder and then here are a couple and there happens to be an India Jaipur one. So let's open this one and uh, you can set a north arrow if you like. I'm just going to skip over that and then we'll start kind of with the uh, object addition process. And um, if, you're if you're familiar with energy modeling, this may all sound very uh, simple to you, but um, at least when I learned about these topics, then I was a little bit... Um, surprised by the fact how we actually have to model the geometry and for this I have just a very few uh, slides just to give you a sense uh, of kind of how this modeling environment works. Um, let me scroll to this. We're basically modeling geometry as um, uh, as kind of a paper house where we don't have any wall thicknesses um, in uh, embedded in the geometry. We just model surfaces that then enclose um, an air volume that we consider a thermal zone. And then um, we assign materials and constructions, obviously, to these um, surfaces that then have a thickness and have physical properties attached to them, um, as well as to the zone itself. We assign 
uh, some internal loads and um, um, strategies how we want to condition these spaces. And then this is all then passed on um, to the simulation engine, which in our case is Energy Plus. So this is a validated simulation engine um, that is, is being developed, actively being developed by the DOE. Um, and um, we are tapping into this as our uh, simulation tool and our software um, uh, basically just takes the geometry and the non-geometric data and then feeds it into Energy Plus. This CSS Axiom, which is the predecessor, uh, um, the, the version before Climate Studio was released kind of uh, um, recently. Um, just to kind of go over the way we want to model these uh, geometries is um, we have different kinds of um, model geometry types. Um, we have the zones, we have windows, and we have shading objects, and we have boundary condition objects. And um, as you can see kind of in the, the Rhino screen, there are these four buttons here that, um, that have these icons for a zone, for windows, for shading devices, and for boundary conditions. And similarly, in the grasshopper side of things, we have, we have the same icons. We have zones, we have windows, we have the boundary condition objects, and we have the shading surfaces. So constructing the geometries is very, um, well, the, the workflow here is similar uh, or analogous. So let's jump uh, into, I'm going to minimize grasshopper and just kind of briefly show how this works on the Rhino side, and then we'll jump into the more advanced workflows. So the simplest way to go about this would, would would be to model a box. Um, this could be my thermal zone for a single um, room. And obviously if I have a building, I have more complex, a more complex setup, maybe I have uh, three of those somehow stacked. So I'll just use the copy command and move those things around. And here uh, comes the first um, kind of uh, important note that when you work with Climate Studio, you should always be careful about snapping. Um, so see how I snap these uh, boxes perfectly to the corner points. So the way um, the software detects whether these zones are somewhat connected in form of a building uh, or in form of adjacencies with partition walls and, and interior slabs is through this, um, through this um, um, you know, surfaces that are congruent in a sense or uh, coplanar. So in this case, it would detect adjacencies automatically. If I were a little bit sloppy like this, it would uh, um, would not be able to, if I move it out of plane a little bit, it would not be able to see that these things are kind of connected. And obviously in this case, visually it makes sense. But if, if it was just a small uh, thing like that, like a small mishap that I did through modeling, I would maybe think that these two zones are actually connected, but they wouldn't be. Uh, and this is one, one of the uh, common modeling mistakes that people make is when you do the, when you build up these geometries, then uh, be careful with kind of precision of how you model these things. Things don't have to be coplanar uh, or congruent in these cases. You could also have a shift, uh, something like that. And the software will automatically intersect uh, these geometries. So I'm just gonna move these things out of plane, uh, so move them, uh, move them out, um, out a little bit, but keep them in the same plane. So, right? so something like this. And then now let's make them actually some thermal zones. So if I click on this button, um, I have a choice uh, here. I can name them and the default is zone. And then I can select um, building zone templates or zone templates that kind of uh, set up the space conditioning and internal loads uh, based on program. And um, we have a few samples here from a Swiss architectural norm inside uh, the, the default library and then a whole plethora of these DOE commercial prototype building models, which give you good assumptions for different kinds of programs and different climate zones. What are the... Um, what are the internal loads assumptions? What are some of the scheduling that's going on in these spaces and so forth? Um, I'm just gonna stick with those simple ones here in the, in the, in the beginning because I'm most familiar with how they are set up. Uh, and uh, let's just say we have an office and it's a medium office and then let's hit okay. And now this turns everything into these thermal zones. And if you wanna make sure that these things have been intersected properly, you can kind of turn off, let's say the roofs and look inside of these models and you see kind of the partition walls and the internal slabs are colored differently than um, the rest of the zones. Uh, so let me turn back on the roofs and then this is my model geometry. Now, maybe let's add some windows quickly uh, to just see how this can then be simulated, um, show results more quickly. That's maybe uh, more motivating than going through all of the nitty gritty details of the zone settings. We'll do that for sure in, this, in a second. Um, so I'll just model some windows quickly. 
uh, onto these surfaces. And again, I'm paying attention that I'm snapping to the corner points and then I'm scaling this inwards a little bit just to kind of uh, not have like 100% window to wall ratio. And then I select both of these windows and the process is the same. I basically say, add the window. It will pick up the ones that I have selected and then ask me what kind of window do I want? So I can uh, assign a glazing material to this. And this is another place to maybe highlight the um, um, diversity of options that we have available in this tool. So this is basically um, a full scan of the IG uh, DB, International Glazing Database, uh, that gives you a, a plethora of options to choose from, glazing systems to choose from. And you can filter uh, from single pane to double pane to triple pane glass. So let's just look at all the double pane glazing systems. And then you can basically have it also sort by uh, U value or by solar heat gain coefficient. And I'm just gonna pick a random one. Uh, it will tell you kind of some metadata and performance data of this glazing system up here. And we'll show you the assembly uh, on the top left. So let's just go with this one. Then there's some other options that you can choose to model such as window frames uh, or a dynamic shading system, which can be exterior or interior, which I'll skip over at this point. And then we have that added to the model. And the way you see that these windows are being properly picked up is that they're colored in the right way, right? So in case you did something wrong and maybe model the window too big, something like that, right? That's something where the model can't automatically understand that your model actually should be part of this uh, thermal model because this window doesn't belong to just one surface. So this, any, any window needs to have a parent surface. And you know this is another common modeling mistake due to let's say modeling imprecision uh, that th these things can happen. And you can immediately see that this is actually not uh, being picked up because this is not colored in the light blue way that it was before. So I'm just gonna undo this and it will uh, pop right into place. And now we could go into the details of the boundary condition objects and so forth, but I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. This is actually a fairly nice model that I can actually already simulate. So let's just hit the run button and you'll see kind of this black DOS window pop up um, which yeah. runs the simulation. And then once it's done, it will disappear and it will um, um, jump to the results panel. So this is another uh, panel of the Climate Studio suit where all of our energy simulation results or, or all of the simulation results are actually uh, collected. And again, this is a snappable, dockable panel. So I'll just pull this in here so I kind of can keep an oversight. And I'll move this right next to it and make this a little bit wider. And then we can explore what uh, the results look like here. So um, we get uh, predicted site EUI, operational carbon, energy cost, and obviously this is now working with uh, US data. So you have to make sure that these conversion factors to um, um, yeah, produce these results uh, match. And I believe Alston uh, has kind of updated our sample workflow that we shared with you in Grasshopper to uh, include those things. And then, um, then you can look at and explore the, the energy res results of this, these three zones kind of at the, uh, below that. So you have uh, building level results, which kind of look at energy use intensity and they're graphed out monthly. Uh, you can switch um, between energy use intensity, and energy use, uh, and then you can look at zone temperature curves, which is maybe a first good indicator whether there's comfort problems in your building. Um, and then you can also look at energy flows to kind of see where where, where are the losses coming from or which, which part of the model is actually causing energy use intensity, right? And then this, if once we're done with this, we can collapse this and kind of look at the um, lower part of the whole thing. And this is where we can now at, per zone, look at the hourly temperatures uh, or hourly data that, that is available to us. And in this case, there's the temperatures which are broken up into relative humidity, T, uh, mean radiant temperature, air temperature and operative temperature. And we can kind of slide through the whole year uh, and look at this in a weekly pattern, right? And we can do this for the different zones. So that there must be one that doesn't have the window that uh, will be a little bit different than the other. And you can kind of flick through and compare them, right? Flick through it like this and compare the different zones. And obviously we also have the energy flows. You can kind of look at the, you know, um, the flow rates that, uh, that are happening in the zone. This is helpful to inspect the buildings uh, a little bit more detail, right? Uh, and then at the bottom, you can export the data as CSV. That's maybe interesting to look at. So if you click on export data, it asks me to um, give a file name and this is gonna do it, put everything onto my desktop. And I'm just gonna call this test.csv. Um, 
And I can also export the IDF. So this is maybe more a pro feature. If you really, if, if you need more features that are available in NG Plus, you can also do that. I'm just gonna do this quickly to show you how this works. And then we can also export reports, which are, is kind of a model summary. Um, again, in CSV format. So you can look at this in Excel and post-process the data if you like. Um, all right, so let's take a look at these files that have been created on my desktop. So I have the test report and the IDF. If I go in this um, with a text editor, you'll see basically all of the simulation inputs that we defined are given to you here in great detail. I'm not gonna uh, explain them all, but if, if you need them, they're there. That's always helpful to know um, that this is transparent. Uh, and then we can look at the data, find out in Excel. This is giving you all of the simulation outputs that um, the software has available and that you requested. So um, there's a lot more than we actually summarized in the graphs here. So if you need to do post-processing, this is one way to do it. You have everything in hourly resolution um, available to you. And then we can look at the last one, which is the report, <clears throat> um, which summarizes the energy model that you just ran. This is helpful to, just make sure and double check that your assumptions are actually carried over correctly. And you can look at kind of the, you know, heating, cooling uh, performance. You can look at U values of the envelope and so forth. So this is maybe also worth exploring as a data set. Um, I know I'm going really fast because I want to kind of jump into the grasshopper side of things. And we have a lot of ground to cover with the zone settings. Um, so let's actually just do that. Um, and so, okay, this is, this is kind of the more traditional uh, Rhino side um, CAD modeling workflow. And, and that may be helpful, but I think um, to do some optimization that some of the more advanced features actually are, are uh, in, you know, interesting in the grass of the side of things. So let me just clear this model um, with the, the, by clicking the trash bin icon here. Um, so we'll, we'll basically strip the information from all of these uh, geometry objects, and then we can use them inside of um, Grasshopper. So starting a model in Grasshopper, uh, the best way, I mean, we could build it from scratch. Uh, that's not a big deal. We could do that, um, but maybe daunting if you're just starting. So um, <clears throat> we have this um, workflow templates component here available for you. And that's the best way to get started with Climate Studio in uh, on the Grasshopper side. So just click and place one of these uh, components on the canvas. And the component itself doesn't do much. Um, it just, um, it just uh, has a selection button here and it shows you a menu. And these me th in this menu, we have all kinds of different example workflows. Um, and the best one maybe to start with when you, when you learn is um, this shoebox model, which is gonna give you a single zone energy model um, set up. Uh, that, that is um, kind of uh, from, from input to output, everything is set up. So if you click on this um, model template, it's actually not even using the geometry that I have here. So I'm just gonna say hide in Rhino and it populates this, all of this, these uh, components as a workflow for you on the canvas. So let's take a look at this more closely. So this seems to be, you know, just a single box as a little bit of a shading device. And then there's a, there's a window here. Uh, and apparently this, this green uh, color indicates that this is, uh, has ground contact as a boundary condition. And then there's an adiabatic surface, which is this red surface here. Um, let's zoom in a little bit and let's take a look at the, the setup. So um, I, I have my zone setup where here I'm connecting geometry to the zone uh, component. And if we click on settings, this is basically uh, giving us all of those settings that we uh, in the previous run selected with a template. If we wanted to assign a template, there's this little um, uh, apply template button where you get the exact same search dialog and we can apply the exact same medium office um, uh, Swiss architectural norm template to the whole thing. Click OK. It will populate all of those uh, UI elements with the settings. And now I can go in here and do some um, tinkering, right? So I can change the number of people. Um, if I like, so this is people per square meter, I don't know, make it a little bit more dense, uh, 0.2, uh, change metabolic rate of these people, I can change the schedules, so this is the occupancy schedule, which defines how many people are actually in the space, click on that, we have, again, you know, a huge library of schedules available to you, 
um, that you can kind of explore. So this is on a Sunday, there's nothing going on. And then this is a typical weekday and you can kind of scrub through the, the year. And we can also edit those schedules, obviously. So we can create our own. So if, we, if, we, if the op office one is great, but actually the Sundays are a little bit different and then you want to modify it. So we can just kind of duplicate that and then say office, and this is going to be my schedule. So I'll just append my name to this, click okay. And now this schedule um, at the bottom is now editable. So I can just actually click on this edit icon. I'm presented with a schedule editor uh, where I could do something with my schedule so, so I can explore the schedule the same way we did. But now I said, I wanna change the Sundays. The Sundays, are, they shouldn't be all empty. Um, and so let's, let's actually um, think about what we could do here. So we could just use some schedule like this, like an all on schedule and make that the um, Sunday schedule, for example. Uh, so the thing is fully occupied on Sundays. So how do we do this the way, uh, one way to do this would be um, to select one of these 24 hour schedules and, and then assign a date range where we want to apply it. So from January 1st to December 31. Uh, and then I want to assign it to all days. No, that's not what I want. All days would be just kind of making it a constant schedule. Um, I can just say weekdays, just weekends, or just pick a day where I want to um, assign the schedule. And I said Sunday. So I just select my Sundays and hit assign. And now we have kind of this, the schedule that def, um, um, defines kind of how, when people are actually in the space um, modified. If I don't like this uh, all on schedule as well, I could just go in here and say, well, let's duplicate that. Let's call it all on, <coughs> hit okay. And then go down to this one and then go in and edit this. So we could just kind of start, oops, start drawing into this something that's a little bit more unique, right? Okay. Hit OK. And then I just have to kind of assign it to the same day. So go ahead. And now this is part of my schedule. Right? Uh, OK, that looks pretty cool. I can, that, I'm happy with that. Um, I, can, uh, I can commit that. Just, just as a side note, if you need access to this data in some other form, if you want to edit these schedules in, uh, in your own spreadsheet application or a text editor, you can do that. So you can just export. You can copy the values to clipboard, and then you can also uh, paste stuff um, from the um, from from a text file. So this is going. This is this is this can be done through these dialogues here. So um, fairly flexible workflow. But let's not uh, get hung up on this. Um, I have so much more to explain. So okay, that's cool. Uh, I like that. Let's click OK. Now I assigned the um, the occupancy schedule for the for the people, um, and I, I customized that. So that's good. The airspeed schedule is something that's relevant for comfort. By default, these are set to zero because we assume can still air inside and um, a well mixed air volume uh, always. If you are using Azure 55 comfort exports, then you can modify that here. Um, the next um, section I wanna go over is the equipment uh, section. This is kind of um, modifying the amount of equipment that is installed in the zone. So the computers uh, or other kind of electrical equipment that we have in spaces all emit heat. And we need to make that part of the energy balance um, to make sure that we are kind of accounting for the right amount of cooling energy required or heating energy required. And the same is true for the lights, but their controls is a little bit different. Um, we have um, the ability to actually dim the lights uh, based on uh, some kind of an estimate of daylight availability in the zone. Um, and th these are the controls for that. So if I select continuous dimming, then actually these lights will be tuned down during the daytime when there is actually daylight available. Um, if I don't want that, I can turn that off, right? Um, so let's, let's turn it off for now and, and move on to the next tab. This, is a, a t this tab is a significantly more complex, but um, let me walk you through it here. Basically what we're doing in this tab is we set um, a thermostat. Right? Um, that's all, basically all that we're doing. There's a lot of text boxes here, but um, there's only few that really matter. Uh, so in this case, we have a heating system that's turned on and it's set to 20 degrees, um, the set point. And all the other, one, uh, other settings down below, we can ignore. And maybe this uh, availability schedule is of interest. Uh, it means that it's always available, right? So if, uh, even in the summer times, there's like a day where it's really cold, um, which can happen here in the US, um, the system will be there and will be kick, uh, will kick in to warm up the space for that one specific day. 
If you don't want that, you can schedule these things and turn them off, force them to turn off uh, at a specific time. But let's not go into that uh, detail. Um, the next important stuff is the cooling system here. We have cooling, the cooling system is turned on. We have um, a text box to define kind of the set point and note how these are um, distant from each other. So there's a delta of six degrees between those two and that's what we call a dead band um, to make sure that these systems don't start fighting each other. If you kind of set them all to the same set point, uh, simultaneous and heating can actually occur and you'll get some funky result where the system starts fighting each other um, for, for kind of the, the right temperature. So always make sure that this, this set point is lower than the cooling set point. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of a delta between them. I would say safe, uh, it's safe up to three, three degrees uh, as a delta. And then, you know, again, we have the same availability schedule and all the other settings we can safely ignore uh, for, at this point. What might be interesting, especially in your climate, is the humidity control. There is uh, a humidistat available as well, where we can uh, dehumidify or humidify outdoor air that goes into the zone. And then we have the mechanical ventilation component, which um, you know, allows you to set kind of the, the uh, minimum required fresh air rates for, for a person and for the, uh, for the area of the program. Right? So this comes right from ASHRAE guidelines where we have minimum fresh air requirements that we have to enter here if we use a mechanically ventilated space. And again, there's an availability schedule. Uh, you can have heat recovery systems and uh, economizer systems as well. So, but let's not dive into those and move to the next tab, which covers ventilation. And ventilation really is here, you can try uh, natural ventilation schemes. Um, you have to be a little bit careful when you do this because you have to coordinate. If you naturally ventilate, you have to coordinate that with your HVAC systems, obviously. If you naturally ventilate and cool at the same time, you'll get some wonky results, right? So this is a little bit of a coordination effort. Um, and we can show, if we have time, I can show how that can be done. Uh, I think there's even an example that uh, helps with the coordination process. Um, and um, then at the bottom, we have the infiltration rate, which is probably the most interesting one. If you have a fully conditioned building, then you really wanna care about uh, this infiltration rate. Uh, all the other things are actually turned off at this point. Uh, and at this point here, it's set to 0.5 air changes um, per hour. So it's a fairly airtight modern building. Um, this could be much higher uh, in, 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 case, in some cases. We can model hot water demand. I'll skip over that and jump to the more interesting part, uh, which is the constructions. So the way the constructions work, and I'm cycling back to my little slide deck, helper slide deck here is um, going back to the model geometry. We, we assign uh, in, this, in these constructions, we assign um, templated, um, assemblies to roofs, facades, partitions, slabs, external floors, and ground floors or ground walls, right? So um, the way this works really is since you're just modeling volumes or boxes, um, and that's, um, that's really convenient that you can actually just model boxes and then it will automatically figure out what a roof is and what a wall is or what a partition wall is and what, is, what a facade is. And the way it does it is by the surface normal. So it will, it will figure out if it's kind of something that is vertical, then that's probably a facade. If there is a vertical element that is adjacent to some other element, then it will treat it as a partition wall. Um, if it is an element that is hor more horizontal, then it will pick it up as a roof. Uh, if it's looking downwards, then it will pick it up as a floor or external floor. If it has a adjacency to ground, then it is obviously a ground uh, slab or a ground wall. Right? So this is really nice and handy and allows you to model um, these, uh, create complex uh, energy models really fast. Um, sometimes you wanna have control over everything, then you can also do that and basically build up a zone by uh, face by face where you assign, for every face you assign a material. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't used this in a very long time. So I, I really like the convenience of this approach, but every modeler is different. So um, you, you pick which one which workflow you like best. Um, and so this is what you set up here. So we can then select a roof construction. And again, we have a huge library available to you to kind of explore uh, available constructions, uh, but in the same fashion as we did it with the schedule, we can now also you know, modify these 
um, by first duplicating one that exists and then hit enter, go to the construction, click on the edit icon. And now I can actually start adding uh, things to this. So let's say I have mineral wool and concrete and you can already notice this is actually not really an architectural setup. Um, like you would argue that this needs to be weatherproofing and so forth. Uh, for energy modeling, we often are kind of uh, lazy and don't care about these things and just um, skip over those layers that ha don't, have, uh, make, don't have a huge contribution to the thermal performance. But uh, you, may, you may argue that actually you want to have those in here and then you can add layers. Um, and now I added a default material layer to this. I can move this layer. I can change its thickness. Um, and I can also change its material uh, to something else like, um, do I have something like plaster? Yes, I do, cement plaster, perfect. Select this one, go ahead. And now I, I modified this construction, click okay. Um, then obviously I wanna also have this selected. Where did it go? Search, Timur, okay. Uh, click OK. And now I assigned kind of for the roof construction something that is actually more like a facade, right? So uh, the, the appropriateness of my choices in this uh, tutorial are questionable. So please, please be wary of those things. And, you know, we can assign the same constructions to, um, to this uh, wall, here, to the facades, and then click OK. And now we covered, to a great extent, what these zone settings are doing. Um, the same, we covered the window settings. Those are exactly the same as you saw them in Rhino. Uh, and then here we see a workflow where we select a surface and make it a ground surface. So this is the surface right here. If, you, if I preview it, it's kind of at this bottom. Turn this preview off. You see kind of this, this surface is actually there to tell the model that this is touching the ground. Um, and the same is true for the adiabatic surface right here. Um, and yeah, the, this is then kind of fed into this energy model component where I can start um, turning things on and off, uh, just uh, preview sake, kind of the exact same way as I did it in Rhino. Um, I do have some more previews going on here. I think this, this thing is previewing the glass. So this, this is why this doesn't show as nice and blue. I can use the slider to kind of change the window to wall ratio parametrically and then, um, yeah, go and run the model. So, and then uh, look at the results. And now I think um, we covered a lot of kind of uh, small things in the energy modeling uh, realm. Uh, let's maybe take a look at a few more kind of example setups. Um, and I'll just maybe, I'll, I'll delete this, uh, this zone, this setup here and just pull out some more um, interesting things um, for you. So if you want to model, um, if you want to model things uh, um, or customize things, materials and schedules, you can, there's also Grasper workflows to do this. You can kind of generate custom constructions with uh, grasshopper methods and then kind of do this parametrically, which can be really handy um, and uh, helpful where if you want to maybe optimize, let's say the, I don't know, the thickness of a material in, in an assembly, then you can, you can definitely do that and connect these components with, um, with some kind of a slider or something like that. Um, you can do the same thing for schedules, um, looking at this. So you can create schedules also in Grasshopper um, just with components and data. And this can be really useful if you want to, for example, uh, use weather data to make a control schedule for your cooling system and for your natural ventilation system, right? So you can pull, bring in weather data and then um, do some simple logic, um, like true false logic or larger than, smaller than logic. Um, to actually create um, a, a Boolean true-false pattern that then allows me to control, um, let's say, a natural ventilation setup, right? This is when I actually want to turn natural ventilation off if the outdoor temperature is larger than 24. So this creates then a custom schedule for me that I can then reference in my energy model. And just to um, note, there was just a question about this. And so th this is what you would want to do if you're setting up a hybrid ventilator, hybrid heating and cooling system where you would, you would define based on the climate times when heating and cooling is available and times when it's turned off and the windows are open. And you just, it, it's more advanced, but you have to set up your, your operational schedules for both your windows and your HVAC um, ac according to like reasonable um, times when you could naturally ventilate. 
Okay, since the question just popped up, maybe I can just show that quickly. Um, so this is really simple in that in that sense because I can also combine these workflows. So I have my library editing workflow and my shoebox model. Bring that back in. Uh, there it is. Uh, we'll just put it on top. So just make sure it moves in the right place. And now these th these things are all kind of piped into this library, and we can connect that library with the model. And they then share this library and I can start accessing some of these schedules that I just created here. So uh, let's say I have my weather dependent control schedule uh, where if the outside temperature is larger, higher than 24, then uh, I wanna turn natural ventilation off. I would do the same thing um, for, for my cooling system, most likely, right? So, but now I would maybe use the reverse logic uh, and say, just invert. I think there's a, a negate component like that. Uh, negative. Mm, I'm not sure this is not doing it. Oh, maybe let's, sorry. I'm, I'm not a grasshopper wizard. Um, so let's maybe flip the logic here. If it's smaller than 24 degrees, right? Um, let's do it this way. Dry bulb temperature and then create one schedule that is kind of the other way around and make sure that this is um, maybe something else, this is, would be natural ventilation on. <laughs> okay, um, let's make sure that the, these schedules are in the library uh, properly. So we just add this to the library, holding down shift. And then now we can go into our zone settings, go into the ventilation tab, choose, turn this on, the natural ventilation, just buoyancy driven flow, click on the availability schedule and then search for nat vent on and off. These are the two schedules that we just created. And um, so we just maybe pick this one, click OK. And then we go to our cooling side of things and then say, no, cooling actually should be when natural ventilation is on, this should be off. Uh, vent on, off. So it's just going to be available in these kind of really hot summer periods, right? Uh, as you see kind of in the schedule. So this is how you would set up this hybrid kind of control, right? So it's a little bit kind of tedious uh, to uh, do the uh, orchestration of when a system can be there and when, when a system should be turned on uh, or off. But this is uh, essentially how you could combine these two workflows. Um, and maybe lastly, one, one thing I want to show is, um, one thing I want to show is the photovoltaic simulation workflow because I think there's a race to net zero that you have to do so let's take a look at solar and then PV simulation. These are actually a sep separate workflow. If you look at kind of the embedded geometry, bunch of boxes with uh, solar radiation or photovoltaic panels uh, attached to them. If I deselect all of this, I'll see some coloring based on the efficiency of these panels. And if you zoom into this, the way this is set up is that I have PV panels, I have some shading context. I specify an efficiency of these systems and I specify an effective area of these systems. And then um, I can set up how many modules in parallel there are and modules in series. And I just model them as just one giant um, uniform panel, which is maybe not exactly right, but, um, but good enough for my kind of first um, uh, analysis. And then again, you know, I select the climate that I'm in and then I run this as a simulation and you'll see how these results change now. Uh, on a monthly basis, I see kind of the performance of each panel and I can also, you know, color code them by their performance, by their respective performance. I just want, if you want to make these comparable because they have significantly different sizes, you should probably uh, normalize the result by the panel area and then you can kind of tell which surface is more effective in collecting energy. As well as you get kind of the total sum of what you have um, collected. Right? And this would be again a good way to combine workflows. You just bring in this photovoltaic simulation workflow, sum up all of the energy that you can collect over a course of a year, and then bring in either the shoebox model or some, some other thing um, to kind of run your simulations. There's more advanced workflows in here that actually do this combined in a combined fashion. You can bring in, um, where's the path to net zero? Can't see it, path to net zero kind of gives you a setup that um, looks at uh, a multi-zone building right here. 
right? Uh, and then also has a photovoltaic simulation workflow attached, and then we can kind of compare how close we are to net zero um, overall in the end. Um, yeah, with that, um, I'm basically uh, at the end of kind of the, the introduction to these tools, but now we wanted to share with you a workflow that uh, we set up to kind of play a simulation game with you, which is kind of an advanced uh, simulation setup in Grasshopper that we have built for you. Um, and should I do that else now? Do you want, do you want to take, take on that? No, just, just hand it over to me, I think, um, at this okay. point. Awesome. And so, and so, Timur, I've been I've been fielding the Q and A while you while you talk, and uh, I probably won't be able to see it anymore. So, if there's new ones, you can you can start. Yes, I'll take over that part. Yep. Yeah, yeah, super. Um, all right, so here we go. All right, and um, so what we what we've set up is um, a, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, eight-story um, commercial office building, although we could change it to residential or any other sort of load type, um, based on some kind of uh, standard inputs um, of like simulation options, um, both for design geometry as well as like typical internal energy modeling, um, uh, thermal loads and schedules um, that. Uh, Yashima helped us uh, define for the Indian context. Um, so, for example, I'm just going to pull up the um, this, the the sheet she sent us that I that I used to define this. Um, we're we're simulating in the Jaipur climate, uh, an office building. The density is not correct, but um, we can we can make the the model look any way we want it to. Um, we have a couple of different glazing options, either like a single pane glazing, a, a double pane clear glazing, uh, a double pane low E, low solar heat gain coefficient glazing, and a triple pane glazing. So these are some options. Um, we can we can have window shades, uh, such as like blinds, either on the interior or the exterior of the building. Um, and for each orientation, we can set the window to wall ratio, the percentage of glazing, um, and the shading overhangs that we're seeing here in this image that we have a, a re relatively decent uh, window to wall ratio with some minor overhangs on the south and the east um, facades. We can set the, uh, we have uh, baseline electric loads of 11 watts per square meter uh, for lighting, um, which is like a kind of fluorescent equivalent. And we can switch that to six watts per square meter uh, for an LED based lighting system. And we can all, we also have the ability to turn on or off daylight dimming. So daylight dimming is that you take advantage of daylight uh, penetration into the space to say if you have um, 150 lux of a 300 lux target, then you dim the lights down by 50% and then therefore save 50% of your lighting energy um, for that hour. Uh, a baseline equipment load is 13 watts per square meter. Um, and if we use like kind of five-star rated appliances or you know the equivalent of like energy star rated appliances in, in North America, um, then we can drop that equipment load down to seven watts per meter squared. In the context of an office, this probably more means that you use energy efficient computers um, such as like more laptops and less like thousand watt power supply rendering machines. Um, <clears throat> and we have three different uh, facade materials as well as some more high performance ones, but um, one that's just a uh, load bearing brick with no insulation inside, uh, 230 millimeters thick. One that's um, similar, but it's um, aerated concrete instead of brick. And then one that's 200 millimeters of reinforced concrete. And actually, I, I didn't put 25 millimeters here. I put 100 millimeters. This is a more highly insulated version, which we'll see in the Grasshopper Canvas. Um, and we have a couple of different options for HVAC systems. Um, we have a, a coefficient of performance of three with a temperature set point of 22. So you cool the building down to 22 degrees. And um, the system is able to remove three watts of heat for every watt of energy you put into it. And we have a split system, a split unit direct expansion uh, uh, system, which is uh, the same system actually as the base case, but you, sit, you change the set point to 26 degrees, so you cool the building less. And then we have a more efficient system with a 
3.7 coefficient performance, the same 26 degree set point, um, but also, um, also a heating recovery ventilator hooked up to it. So it recovers um, some of the heat that is uh, lost or the cooling, if you want, that's lost when, um, when providing fresh air from the outside. Uh, and so the, the way this looks in our grasshopper definition, which, which I'll be operating, and we're going to pull you guys and ask what you think should be the best thing to do, um, is that there's a, a series of drop downs, right? So um, we have single pane clear glazing, which I'll start with here. So this is all the glass, these are all the glass options. There are different types of um, glazing. Um, we have the ability to set exterior and interior shades through this drop down. We're going to leave the building as an office type, but you can see we can change the type of building it is. Um, we have uh, the baseline equipment energy use and the five-star appliance equipment energy use here. Uh, I spelled fluorescent wrong, but that's okay. We have 11 watts per meter squared and six watts per meter squared um, lighting um, information. We have the ability to turn on or off dimming. We have the HVAC systems here from the baseline 22 degree set point to the 26 degree set point to the 26 degree set point with heating recovery ventilation. Um, we have our different constructions here. So the, the brick construction, which has a U value of about 2.3, the aerated concrete construction, which has a U value of about 0.36. This is watts per square meter. So it's much less heat that's being transferred for this one. And then we have the reinforced concrete plus 10 centimeters of polystyrene, which is a lot, um, but it gets us to an even higher insulation threshold. So it gives us a U value of 0.26. And then we also have um, some, um, some materials that Timor put in earlier, which get, get us uh, down to a, a U value as low as 0.1. So it's a very highly insulated wall. You can see we input just a massing geometry and some floor heights, and what that what comes out is this building over here. So if you if you guys want to change the geometry, let Timor know in the Q and A, and we can we can do that. We can also set our window to wall ratios here. So for example, right now my south facade is 60% window, and if I say, well, that's too much, I want to make this 35% window, I can just do that, and you'll see that. The script after a second. Should update. Did it update? Yes, it did. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, because this is the south. Sorry, that's why I was I was confused. Um, so here's the Actually, south. Yeah. So I, I was looking at was the west facade. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so there was a question in the chat where I thought it's really helpful um, for everyone mm -hmm. to know is uh, how do you bring in context like trees, terrain, and other buildings? And I think this uh, example that you're showing has a great workflow to uh, kind of pick um, urban context. And then there's this uh, inside of the cluster, um, this workflow that basically also selects only the uh, relevant surfaces that cast a shadow onto the building. Because mm -hmm. I, I, as I mentioned in the, um, in the chat or in the q and that if you, um, you have to be careful when you bring in terrain and uh, outside, you know, other geometry um, regarding their complexity. So Energy Plus is very sensitive to polygon counts. So if you bring in a tree with a million of triangles, your simulation will probably crash. And uh, therefore, there, there are these workflows in Climate Studio that help you to simplify complex geometry um, to either just the, the surfaces. So here you see kind of an urban context that has been loaded from a different tool called Urbano that just can load OpenStreetMap data uh, and build these buildings for you automatically. But we don't actually want all of the geometry in, uh, in our simulation model. We only want the surfaces that cast a shadow. And then inside of this cluster, you'll see how there's a Climate Studio component that you know um, runs um, sends out rays to see which surfaces uh, actually can be seen by our model and then just selects those for uh, simulation. The other way, other modes of this shading mask component where you could actually feed in, let's say terrain and then uh, construct a virtual horizon um, for your building. And you could also apply that obviously to things like trees and other contexts. So instead of kind of using the actual surfaces, you could construct like a virtual 
horizon around your around your building to model like let's say um, a mountain range or something like that. Yep. We won't go into that right now though. Um, yeah. So just just to show the window the window again because I was I was a little confused at the orientation. North is um, always in the y positive axis. So this is north. This is south. This is east. And this is west. So if we wanted to change our west window to wall ratio, we could you know, maybe increase it if we wanted to. I don't know if that's the best, um, but so over here we have 40%. And by changing this, you see my windows get occupy a much larger percentage of the, of the wall now. Um, so there was one other question that I promised I would answer live, which is how do you make kind of Indian context um, construction materials? And here you can see that I've, that I've made these uh, for, the, for the workflow today, and it's relatively straightforward. So let me just, um, let me just um, copy one of these and show you how it works down here. So there's this material selection component, which is um, just from the library, get material. And when I click on select here, I have a huge library of construction materials that I can that I can use to kind of start building up any sort of um, any sort of construction that I want, right? So I could um, I could look for structural concrete. I could just type in concrete. It's a little slow, but um, there we go. And you know I've got reinforced concrete to certain to certain um, structural capacities. Um, right here, and I plug this into a layer component, and I give it some some sort of thickness. So maybe we we have, um, you know, fifteen centimeters of structural reinforced concrete for this construction, and this could just be something like a floor slab. I'm just naming the construction that it goes into here ultimately. Oops. What just happened? Why does Grasshopper just close sometimes, Timor? All right. Um, I don't know. That's not our fault. <laughs> yeah, it's not our fault. But, um, and then, you know, so for, so for example, now when I look at this, it is um, called Floor Slab Alston, and the information says it's, uh, you know, it's telling me it's calculated U value, which is pretty high, um, given that it's just very, very dense concrete without any aeration. Um, you know, this is an internal floor slab, so maybe we don't care about that, but we can also, um, you know, further refine it if we want to. So we could um, produce a second layer. So if it's, if it's a floor slab um, with carpet on it, for example, we can, uh, we can add a finished surface to this. I don't know if you have carpet in here, but maybe we'll see. Yep, beautiful carpet. Um, we can give ourselves uh, probably not 15 centimeters of carpet, but maybe one centimeter of carpet. So kind of a sh slightly shaggy carpet. Um, and then we can plug in just add it in here to the layers. And now we have a construction. It's gonna drive me crazy. Now we have a construction that is consisting of, um, oops, it's consisting of two layers, um, which I can show you more easily. With the panel, when it loads to the canvas. So here it shows me my, my layers are, you know, from outside the zone to inside the zone, carpet, uh, concrete and carpet. So I might, I might actually want to reverse these um, in their order. So now I have a, a layer of carpet on top of a layer of concrete. And you can, you can construct any construction you want in this manner. Um, for now, I'm just going to... A good way to organize the order is the merge component. If you just type merge. 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you can beyond directly plugging them in, you can you can have a component that that literally shows you the the order of the input. This is it. This is a grasshopper thing. So now I can just plug carpet on top and um, concrete on the bottom. And then, you know, now I have a kind of user interfaceable display of the order of the way those materials are being connected. And I would just take the output and connect it to my construction. So that, that's how you build custom constructions. Um, and I, I built these, these three um, for the solar decathlon context. So let's, um, let's just go ahead and get started. So we, we have not run any simulations yet, but we might as well run one. So I'm going to run a calculation right now. And to do so in this script, which again, we'll, we'll distribute the kind of updated version to the, to the organizer so you guys can play with it as well. Um, before I get started, I'm just gonna clear any recorded data and reset our counter. But after I do this once, you don't have to mess with it again. And um, click run. And so like what you saw before, this will run a simulation. This is going to take a little bit longer than what Timur showed because here we have um, eight thermal zones and shading context and a lot more windows to calculate the shading too. So it'll take about, you know, maybe 30 to minutes, 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Um, so it's still pretty fast. And we can see its progress as it goes. And after this is finished running, what we're going to do is we're gonna take a look at the energy consumption of this building and we're going to run a little poll. We're going to ask you guys <clears throat> what aspect you think we should start modifying first. Um, the one thing I forgot to mention, which I will do right now while it's still running, is that this is for the Jaipur climate, right? So um, I did a little bit of just pre-climate um, graphing. So this is this is from the um, the, uh, the Indian governmental weather file for Jaipur. Um, typical meteorological year. And what we can see is the kind of range of temperatures um, for each month. So the black line is the median temperature. And then the shape of these kind of little violins indicate the frequency of temperatures within that month. So we can see in January, the median temperature is around 15 or 16 degrees um, Celsius. Um, but the, the range goes from uh, as low as maybe like four degrees to as high as like 26 degrees. In February, the median is maybe like a little higher. And in June and July and August, we're, we're getting, um, or actually May, June, July and August, we're getting really high temperatures peaking over 40 degrees and the, the median temperature being uh, like 34 degrees. So, you know, pretty hot climate, um, a little cool, um, in the winter, but mostly at night. Um, and I plotted the humidity as well. So this is a radiation. Uh, I plotted the humidity as well. And you can see it actually um, kind of forms a bit of a sinusoidal pattern um, throughout the year. Um, in in um, the, the colder periods, um, like winter and uh, sort of January and December, you have generally like higher humidity values. And then also during the very hot summer, um, later summer months, July and August, you have pretty high humidity values. But there's certain times in the year where the humidity is, is pretty dry as well. So like 30% medians in February, March, April. So you have a range of humidities that vary seasonally. And the total solar availability is, is, is quite high in Jaipur. So there's a lot of sunshine. It's about two, almost 2000 kilowatt hours per square meter per year on a flat surface, which is um, significantly more um, than Toronto gets about 25% more than where I live. Okay, why is it running multiple times? Is the yeah, run button just... The timer? the timer doesn't connect to the energy model. Okay. Hmm. It did not do this. The run button is stuck down. See, like it's just, it stayed depressed because Grasshopper is terrible. Okay. Um, I'm going to run this one more time just to kind of fix this. Um, somehow when I'm sharing my screen, my, like, my Grasshopper just bogs down a lot. So I'm going to run this one time. 
So while you maybe um, <clears throat> rerun this, uh, there were a couple of uh, really interesting questions in the chat um, that we mm -hmm. should maybe go over. So the first one was, can we add um, like a staggered building massing? Um, and just to kind of reply to this, yes, of course you can. You can um, model whatever complex kind of geometry you would like um, and stagger the building and so forth. I think uh, for Elston to do this right now as a demo is probably not so easy because the setup is, um, you know, it's built to kind of uh, automatically generate all the windows and uh, working off of a simple kind of box-like geometry. But obviously you can input your custom geometry, right? So it's probably, if you want to do the staggering, um, then it's probably best to just draw that in Rhino and um, as staggered boxes, and then you feed that into uh, this script by just replacing right. kind of the, the zone geometry. Maybe Elson, you could maybe just show once this is done where you would kind of replace the geometry in the script. Yeah. Um, then there was another really good question which uh, asked about kind of uh, geometry format and data type, um, uh, whether uh, mesh or NURP surface and so forth. And that's actually something that I didn't cover in my introduction, which I should have, um, is that uh, Climate Studio only supports planar surfaces. So uh, even though Rhino can do uh, doubly curved surfaces really easily, um, you should only model planar surfaces and you should model them as um, BREP or uh, NURP surfaces, even though they're planar. Um, and then Ryan, um, Prime Studio will convert that into a mesh that goes into um, goes into Energy Plus. Uh, but it doesn't understand meshes and it doesn't understand doubly curved surfaces. This is a limitation that you should all be aware of. Yep. Okay, so we get a couple of, uh, we get three kind of key feedbacks over here. Um, we get the, the kind of thermal loads, which is basically where, um, like where uh, heating is coming or into the building essentially, or uh, or being um, removed uh, from the building as it might be by by um, by systems, um, and you know we can kind of see like where the kind of major thermal loading of our of our envelope uh, is coming from. Um, we can see there's a lot of, of heat gains due to fresh air mechanical ventilation. This is the dark blue here. Um, we can see a lot of heat gains through the windows. This is just a single pane clear window. So there's probably a lot of solar heat gains, especially in the hotter months. Um, we can see a fair amount of, of heat gains coming through envelope conduction, which is this green ENV color. And also through infiltration, especially during the summer. So air leakage through the envelope. Um, and you know, the, by contrast, the internal heat gains um, are quite low due to um, equipment, so um, loads in the office um, and people and lighting. Now, I would like to no note that this is pretty unusual for, for an office building that is high performance, because usually if you have like a really high quality envelope, you don't have as many of these kind of exter external gains, and you'll start to see that these internal loads start to take up more, um, more of your, your, um, your heat gains in the space. Um, so what this, what this means is that it, in my impression, we should, um, you know, we can, we can identify our biggest energy reduction targets here, which um, are due to ventilation, uh, due to heat gains to the windows, due to heat gains to the envelope, and due to air leakage. So we don't have air leakage as a parameter set up in the game, but that's one of the things that we could modify in the energy model, um, which would have to do with construction quality. And we can also see the monthly energy consumption breakdown. And we can see just, uh, this is kilowatt hours per square meter, so it's EUI. And, you know, we can see that, that there's just like a massive amount of cooling energy required um, before this building. Um, the total EUI at, as of the initial run is, is about 192 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So this is our single number kind of visual. And then we also have a carbon breakdown. Um, although Timur alluded to the fact that I updated the carbon numbers for the Indian electrical grid, um, I have not actually done that. This, this is a, this is um, kind of like a default um, carbon number. And if you if you really wanted to get to this, you'd need to look up the kind of carbon conversion factors for your specific region of of India and plug that in. So I didn't look up what it would be for Jaipur. I don't know the mix of um, energy sources, um, but you know, it, this, this is, this will be a decent indicator, um, but it's not the, it's probably not the correct absolute value. All right. So now that we've done that, uh, I think it's going to be time to, 
um, to run a bit of a quiz uh, or a poll. And I'm going to give you guys um, three options. So, and the questions are this. So what do you think we should we should update first? So we, we saw that the, the heat gains to the windows were, were some of the largest heat gains in this building. Do you think we should update the window to wall ratio? That, that'll be option one. Or let me type this out actually so you, um, so you, um, so you can kind of get a sense of it. Um, so let's say we have three options, right? Option one is to update the window to wall ratio. Um, option two is to update the exterior shading. And option three is to update the window um, construction quality. So um, I believe the organizers will run a poll now and you can answer one of these three options and then we'll, we'll adjust the model and see how it changes. So go ahead and go ahead and vote. Oh, here we go. So you should get this little window popping up. Oh, you actually changed the name. That's very nice. Give you a minute or two. And to the to the to the organizers running the poll, just you know, once we get like fifty or more votes, I think we can, um, I think we can I'm just show the results. The yeah. Okay, super, super. Yeah. So let's see what we get. Yeah, I'm sure. Just to kind of, oh, okay. Oh no, it's so balanced. <laughs> but there's one more <laughs> vote. There's a single additional vote for exterior shading. What would you have done, Timor? Uh I'm fielding questions. I didn't think about it much, but uh, let's do <laughs> shading. <laughs> well, we're going to do um, shading. Shading is the winner. Um, okay. Actually, so... actually, Elson, there's another question. Uh, actually, this came through the Q&A, um, looking at the change of orientation and cooling load. So maybe um, rotating the city would be a, an option too. <laughs> yeah, we could also do that. I, I won't rotate it now, but we can change the orientation of the windows, right? So right now, uh, if we look at how our window glazing is distributed, it's 60% window to wall ratio on the north facade, which is this one that I'm circling with my mouse. 40% window to wall ratio on the east facade. 35% uh, window to wall ratio on the south facade. And 60% window to wall ratio on the west facade. So the, the suggestion here was to just, I think, increase the shading depth. And so, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to maybe make a pretty hefty overhang on all on all facades except uh, for the north one. So the north I'll leave unshaded, but I'll put 1.5 meters um, on the east facade, on the west facade, or on the south facade, and on the west facade. Right. So when I click, um, when I re-enable my solver here you'll see that my model will update and it does. So now I have shades on all facades, even for this facade that is quite close to this neighboring context building, we still put some shades on it, right? So, you know, we're going to see how much mitigating exterior so solar gains through a shading system like this will help with our energy consumption. So we were at, and I'm gonna just gonna create, um, um, we were at, uh, for our baseline, 192.5 uh, kilowatt hour kilowatt hours um, per square meter. So this is just a, a little tab to run it through. So let's let's run this, um, and then we'll we'll have a moment to oops, not reset the count. That would be terrible. Run. So we're going to see what happens. Um, I predict the energy consumption will reduce, um, and we'll see by how much. Um, it's, it's interesting because I, my, when I see these numbers in terms of these massive amounts of heat gains, um, certainly a lot of it is due to solar because there, there is a lot of sunlight. Um, where I go first is actually because there was some shading and because this is in a dense, relatively dense urban context, my first thought is actually to in, increase the, uh, the glazing quality to have a lower solar heat gain coefficient um, rather, rather than to um, adjust the shading. So. Um, but you know, I, um, I, you know, that's just that was just my uh, initial intuition. So let's see what happens. So we've adjusted our office model. It will process the results, and all right, great. 
So now we can go back over to our right-hand side and see what we get. Um, and you'll see that the energy uh, consumption has reduced. Uh, it's reduced by about seven or so um, kilowatt hours per square meter. So, you know, here we add 1.5 meter shading and we've gotten to 185.9 kWh uh, m squared, right? Um, now, we can also look at this still. We can still see there's a pretty substantial heat gain through our windows, right? So that, that's still um, beyond the mechanical ventilation. Um, that's still one of our, one of our major, most major gains. And throughout the whole year, we can see there's heat gains through the window, right? Um, so let's, let's continue to attack the windows, um, but let's, let's think about it in some of the other, um, in terms of the other two capacities we have with the window, right? So let's, let's say that we've done shading. And so now, um, now we've got two options, but we're going to, we're going to do, um, we're going to do this. Um, So we've got, we've got three options here um, to reduce the window to all ratio, to, to install a double pane window with low emissivity, which will have a, a lower U value. So it'll conduct less conductive heat, but it will also have a, a lower solar heat gain coefficient. So direct solar heat gains will be mitigated. And the triple pane is the same, it just does it a bit more. Um, so what do, you, what do you guys think should be the next one? Uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna run another poll. Should we reduce the window to all ratio? Um, or should we um, just increase our envelope construction quality? There was a strong suggestion to rotate the long facade uh, north, south, east, west. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's also an option. Um, and I think that would make some difference. Well, let's... Um, Let's, uh, we can also do that um, before, we, before we continue with the poll. Since the poll hasn't shown up yet, I will just um, kind of, uh, oh, oops. Oh, we had more than two I options had to anyways. I recreate the poll, so it took some time, so I hope Oh, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but let's, let's uh, actually, let's just cancel the poll for a second, if you don't mind. Okay, cool, yeah. Thank you, thank you. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, update our massing geometry. So the way I'm going to do this is by um, not, not that one. So we have a, a massing B rep here, which is embedded in Grasshopper. I'm going to bake it into my uh, into my Rhino context. So what I should see is that I now have this geometry here, and if I just rotate it. You know, I'm gonna. It's gonna end up going into the street of our urban context, but oops, this is one of the great benefits of let's see. As long as we don't intersect with any buildings, do we intersect with some buildings? Uh, we kind of do. I'll just move this a little bit around. All right, so you know, obviously, this um, you have some serious construction zoning issues if you want to build your building in the street, uh, but we can do this in the energy model with no problem. So I'm just going to re-reference this this um, object I just created back as our massing geometry, and what you'll see is now um, my model is rotated. So what we've just done is we've flipped the model, so it's kind of got an actual north-south um, predominant orientation. So you have a lot more glazing on the north and south, uh, a lot less on the east-west, which changes the proportions of the building, right? So um, our, our iteration three um, is in fact going to be changing the orientation. So let's run this. Oh no, I clicked the wrong button. Um, so you just have to, um, you know, live with the fact that I just broke the script a little bit, but this will still give us a result. We're tracking them anyways here. So our, our option three is going to be um, change orientation to north-south. Maybe I'll start to find these like this. Thank you. 
All right, great. So um, what we're going to have here, so our, our, what I messed up with this group was the carbon numbers. So you can actually see we do get some reduction, but probably not as much as you, as you may have expected, right? Um, so we're down to 182.3 kilowatt hours per square meter. And uh, so that's only a three, a three and a half um, EUI difference. Um, all right. So now I'm, I'm going to ask, I, I want to ask the same poll again. Um, so what, sh what should we change now? If, because the windows are still a, a very large portion of our, of our heat gains into the space. Um, so do we want to option one, reduce the window to wall ratio? Option two, um, install double pane low E glazing? Or option three, install triple pane low E glazing? Yeah, and so here you have your options popping up. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll now. Yeah. Okay, great. You guys are super fast. I love it. <laughs> uh, here's the result. Option, option one, reduce the window to wall ratio. You know, uh, I, I, what, what I take from this is that the participants in this webinar are definitely architects that want to really work with the, with the kind of formal aspects of the building envelope first. And, that, and I totally empathize with that. And I think reducing the window to wall ratio is probably reasonable here. So let's, um, let's, let's do a couple of things. So we, we know that the sun is going to be lower in the east and the west. And even though this is a kind of a, a pretty dense urban context, um, maybe we'll just reduce our east and west windows to maybe 20% um, window to wall ratio. Um, and I won't reduce the shading depth, even though that's going to change quite a bit. Um, and let's, let's um, you know, we already are at a pretty low window to wall ratio on the south, but maybe I'll turn it to 30. And maybe I'll turn the north, because um, there's less capacity for solar heat gains from the north to 40%, right? So, you, you know, you, what you'll note, um, when I view the building now is I have pretty much a lot smaller windows. Oops. Especially on the east and the west. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and run this one more time. And so I think this will, um, you know, we could, we could still, you know, modify the window more. Um, but maybe we'll start to take a look at some of the other parameters next, and I'll just ask, I'll ask you guys after we see the results of this, which one we should, we should go to next. Um, so, you know, we're continuing, we're continuing to modify our building. Um, here we reduced um, the window wall ratio on all orientations. And we'll see, we'll see how much that gets us. So, so, so far we've shaved off 10 kilowatt hours per square meter um, or so uh, from the building energy consumption. Elson, could we look at the, um, the energy use breakdown and the flows to see where the highest impact, uh, biggest bang for the buck could be get, gained? Yeah. I mean, isn't that, isn't that what the thermal loads in this, um, in this model is because we're in a heating climate or a cooling climate? Um, yes. Okay, but we'll, we'll do that in a second. Um, so here, we dropped to 174, right? So that, that's kind of... Um, reasonable, so 1.74.6 kWh meter squared. And again, so we're gonna take a look at this, at this breakdown again. And so you, what you'll notice is um, window is this orange color, right? Electric lights are yellow, heat gains from people are red, from fans are slightly darker red, and equipment like computers and such are, are, are um, darker kind of burgundy. <clears throat> Um, what, uh, what we're kind of clearly seeing here is that, you know, we've, we've done a fair amount to kind of shade and reduce the size of these windows. And accordingly, the kind of loads on the building for the windows um, have dropped down. And actually, I would say now it looks like the building envelope, conductive heat gains through the building envelope is, are slightly outpacing our pretty much 
on par with heat gains through the windows. So these are kind of equivalent. Um, again, infiltration, which is one we won't be able to modify in this game, is kind of moderate. And then ventilation, so just providing fresh air from the outdoors, is, is contributing to a huge um, amount of our total thermal load. And, and Timur, what does system mean here in, in loads? Mm, unmute myself. Um, the, the system is kind of, um, is what is being used to, um, to either drive the cooling or, or heating system. There's a, there's a component there. Okay, but we don't, we don't see it in, um, oh, it might, well, is this because this needs to have like a negative, a negative part to the range? Yes. Okay, whoops, that's my mistake. Oh, there we go. So now we can see the, the heat, the heating and cooling in this as well. So you can see that there's a lot of cooling load um, as well coming into the, or being removed from the building. So this this cooling removal bar should be roughly the same height as this heat gains bar. So before we were just looking at the heat gains. Yes. Um, Correct. All right. So none, nonetheless, um, you know, our, our heat gain problem, like if we could address the efficiency of this system. Um, and potentially the efficiency of the of the mechanical ventilation um, at the same time. So, um, and I, I'm not going to run a poll for this one because these are like clearly some of the largest energy consumption gains. Um, but the the uh, let me explain what I'm going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to employ a heating and ventilation and air conditioning system or an HVAC system that has both a heating recovery ventilator and an economizer. Um, as well as is more energy efficient at removing at removing heat from the building, right? Um, so we can go back over here to our kind of um, context and, you know, beyond just using a kind of baseline HVAC system and cooling the building to 22 degrees, um, we can decide to cool the building to a, to a higher temperature, only to 26 degrees, or, um, or even... Um, use like the most efficient um, HVAC system while while cooling the building to 26 degrees and taking advantage of a heat exchanger um, at the at, at the, on the fresh air supply. Um, so I'm going to set this one, which is um, kind of like a very good quality HVAC system for the Indian context, as I've been led to believe. But you actually can do even better than this um, with with like even more advanced systems like ground source heat pumps or even some very efficient chillers or heat pump systems can do better than a COP of 3.7 on cooling. But we're gonna, we're gonna go with that for now. So I've, I've just changed to the HVAC super efficient split unit system. And I'm gonna run this. And Nelson, just a heads up, we are at the hour. Um... So, oh, okay. Yes. So we're at the, we're at the end. All right. This will. This will. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I thought we had another 30 minutes for some reason, but yeah, we are at the hour. So let's yes. let's conclude with this one with maybe just any like pressing questions that you think we should address. But I've kind of shown you guys how to use this. It was a small game. Game. Um, so H back improved. One one question in the Q and A that. Um, that could be interesting as to, I mean, uh, we only have horizontal louvers, maybe if you could show like how and where one could maybe insert vertical louvers, um, that would be helpful for the modelers. Sure. Yeah, but I for can, that, I, I don't think we that. would, we would need to run a simulation, but just no. how to, you know, incorporate it in, in the model would yeah. be good enough. Yeah. I can do that. I just, I, I just want to, I do want to show that the, the HVAC system is, is yeah, really yeah. important here before we finish. Um, so just give me a moment here. And so installing a better HVAC system uh, has been the biggest, the biggest energy saving component so far. It drops us down to 110.7 kilowatt hours per square meter, right? Um, and you know, at this point, once you get to that, you can kind of see that reducing like lighting, um, heat gains from lighting and heat gains from equipment. Um, and also potentially improving the construction quality of the walls and windows to, instead of using single pane glazing, to use maybe double pane glazing or maybe more high insulation values will start to make a lot more sense um, at this point. All right, so that's that. That's kind of like, you know, we went from 192 to 110, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty decent energy reduction, but not, 
to net zero levels yet. Um, and so just this question about how you add in shading, uh, I'll just show that really quick uh, on the canvas here. So in this networker component, there's there's always just this shading object that takes that takes in geometry. So if I wanted to make like vertical um, vertical fins on this building, let's say on the south facade for whatever reason, um, I could just draw them. And so here I'm just modeling, um, you know, some, oops, some kind of, um, I'm just placing them willy nilly, but, uh, or just randomly, but um, some fins on the facade. And if I select these geometries, these are one meter deep fins kind of in between the windows. Um, I can just load them in to Grasshopper. <laughs> Delightful. Set multiple B-reps. And so now you can see these are showing up as green when I highlight it there in my model. And I can just add them to the shading component, right? And so now, even though these aren't parametrically controlled, parametrically controlled by, um, by just creating any geometry that's, that's a kind of a planar geometry and hooking it to the shading component, it's going to be included in my simulation model. And so as noted, I won't run another simulation now, but it's, it's pretty straightforward to add, to add any sorts of shading geometry. So our inputs here, there's three inputs now to this shading geometry thing. One is the urban context shading geometry. One is the horizontal louvers, and then now the vertical fins that I just that I just added um, just by drawing them in Rhino to my model. So um, yeah, I mean I know we're over time, so I really and I know it's late um, for you guys in in India. Um, So really, thank you for coming. Thank you for allowing us to show the software. Thank you for gamifying the kind of prog process a little bit with us. Um, we probably would be nicer to have had a bit more time, but you know, I think there's a lot of ground to cover with energy modeling. So I hope you found that useful and you can always reach out to us with any additional questions. Um, I would say do it through your, your school coordinators rather than sending us all individual emails. That way the, in, the information dissemination is a bit better. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, just a final. Right. Um, uh, yep. Yep. Go ahead, Timur. From my, side, uh, from my side as well, it was great to have so many participants join in. I hope you find the tool useful. And again, you know, we're we're willing to. Uh, we're really excited that you use this for uh, Solar Decathlon Fund India. Um, if you want to ask questions and kind of help yourself, the, there's another way you could go about this uh, is to use the Rhino Discourse Forum. I sent um, a, you know, um, a shortcut in, uh, or a link in the chat of this, uh, of this uh, webinar as well as in the Q&A. So you can use that, use the Climate Studio tag. Elson and I will probably once in a while skim through this and field some questions, but I think this is a great way to help yourself. Uh, as well. So if some, uh, if you have a question, there's going to be a whole community answering your question um, uh, as a kind of alternative route uh, going other than going through your school uh, coordinators. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much, Alston and Timur. I think the session was great. And uh, I think q and I mean, the way you guys handled uh, brilliant. And thank you everyone for participating today. And we will see you next week on Saturday at 4.30 p.m. for the next webinar. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.